Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tijan Roshko. I am a professor at the Interior Design Department. Um, I'm going to invite Zoe Zimberg, one of our lovely uh, MID2 students, to introduce our next guest speaker. Good morning, and thank you all for coming. Today is my it is my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Professor Graham Brooker, a very special guest from London. Yesterday I had the opportunity to take part in a discussion with Graham and some Masters of Interior Design students, which sparked dialogue on adaptive reuse, the interior sensibility, and cultural production. So I am excited to hear more in depth from Graham this morning. Graham is currently the head of interiors at the Royal College of Art, London, and a practicing interior designer. Graham has published on many aspects of the interior space, and his research interests focus on the cultural, historical, and philosophical implications of adaptive reuse of existing buildings. His recent publications include Adaptations and Key Interiors since the 1900. He's co-edited eight books with Sally Stone on the interior, including the highly acclaimed rereadings, and is recently edited with Lois Weinthal, The Handbook of Interior Architecture and Design. His current publications include Brinkworth, So Good So Far, and The Story of the Interior, a reworking of Gombrich's classic publication, but utilizing narratives of enclosed spaces. And today, Graham will be presenting Working with the Not New. And with that, I ask that you help me in welcoming Graham to the podium, Professor Graham Burger. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks for a great introduction. Um, I'm slightly anxious about this sign behind me. <laughs> this is a Winnipegian joke. I get it. It's a good one. I'm hoping it's not a kind of uh, a comment on uh, the intellectual endeavors that I'm about to unleash. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I think this is the coldest place I've ever visited in my life, but uh, I believe that's normal. Um, thanks very much to the conference organizers, and um, thanks a lot to you guys for turning out at 9 a.m., my God, on a Saturday morning. This slot in a conference is normally known as the graveyard shift, because it's the morning after the night before. So uh, I'm honored that you've all come out to see me. Um, this is a talk called Working with the Not New, and um, it's a bit of a kind of discussion about my work, work I do, work I do with students. I don't really practice anymore, I don't really have time for that. I write and educate. Um, and I'm going to explicitly kind of address some of the themes of the conference about adaptation and uh, use some of the work that I've written about, in, in particular a book called Adaptations, which is quite handy, seeing as that's the title of the conference. Before I get to that, I'd like you to indulge me just for a, a short time, because I'm going to give you a bit more of an in-depth in introduction about me in order to contextualize my work and, uh, and tell you a bit about where I'm coming from. I'm an interior designer and I trained as an interior designer uh, in Manchester back in the day and practiced for a number of years and uh, have taught interiors, interior architecture, interior design in schools of architecture, schools of design, all kinds of different places. And uh, I'm what's known as an advocate for the subject and always have been, and I find it a fascinating subject. And when I was a student, uh, I remember my tutors saying to me things like, uh, well, I would say, where do you find out this information about this subject? And they'd be like, Ooh. you know, all that was around were some couple of books about nice kitchens and bathrooms and things like that, etc." There was nothing of real intellectual substance, apart from maybe one or two books. And uh, so that kind of always stayed with me, that thought. And as I became a practitioner, then I started working in education, I kind of thought, well, I need to sort of address that somehow. And I want to talk to my students in a way where I can help to substantiate this subject and talk about really some of the intellectual ideas behind what we do in interiors. And we're sort of a little bit beyond just the bathroom and the curtain. So all of my career, really, uh, thus far, has been about some of these words, looking at the interior as a room, as a set of spaces, considering it as waste, because I'm a firm believer that the interior is part of uh, the, the fundamental ideas of reworking existing buildings. I'll, I'm going to come to that in this talk. 
but also talking about history, theory of the subject. Um, the history of the interior is absolutely totally different to the history of architecture, and uh, I still find that amazing that people don't understand that. Um, the history of the interior has, in many ways, nothing to do with architecture, um, and uh, that's the subject of my latest piece of work. But I've really set out to spend a lot of time researching, defining, setting up ideas about the interior, and really trying to help my students and other people to understand what this subject can really mean. Of course, it's not the total meaning. There are many other people doing this as well now. And please indulge me. This is a moment for me to sell. Um, that's primarily manifested itself as books. You need to buy them all. There's about 320 shopping days to Christmas, so please treat yourself. It's primarily manifested itself as books, a number of publications, because I, I write now, I love writing. I was very unacademic at school, and I've kind of come to it very late, and thus have become fascinated by it. I actually think writing a book is much like designing a building or an interior, it's the same. You have a client, usually me, haha. <laughs> you have a structure, you have a brief, you have a program, all sorts of things. It's exactly the same. A book is the same as an interior or a building. Funnily enough, one of the most recent ones is a book called Adaptation, so that's quite handy, seeing as that's the name of this conference. And um, I'm going to try and ex address some of the themes in this book. I'd also, just before we go any further, I'd like to... I realised yesterday, um, sitting through some of the wonderful uh, conversations yesterday, nobody's explicitly uh, referred to adaptation and what it means. I'm a great fan of looking in a dictionary. I love dictionaries. I'm a bit of a dictionary nerd, and I um, have... Uh, wonderful etymology dictionaries at home which tell me the root of words and I find words and language a little bit like a great building much like the Forks where it's got a history and a layer over time and you know buildings like words have become to mean different things. When you look up the word adaptations you de it's derived from the Latin word uh, ad and aptare which is to fit, to adjust and to modify and you know, I, I think that makes sense. That's what adaptation is about. It's about to fit, to modify something. And when you think about buildings and interiors, well, adaptations is explicitly about that, how we fit, how we adapt, how we work with the not new in order to change them into something else. So working with the not new, well, apart from me doing the hard sell on publications, I really want to talk to you today about adaptations directly and also atmospheres as well. I should say, actually, on that last slide, I forgot. Whoops. The, my book adaptation is an adaptation in itself. One of the one, only one... Uh, there was two books when I was a student which I could rely on for some authentic stroke intellectual information about the interior. One of those was the book on the left... No, the right, your right. No, your left. Uh, adaptations by Philippe Robert in the early 90s. A great book, and so good, I nicked the title. Working with the not new. Why is this called so? For the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to describe the adaptation of the, the existing and why it's important and how we might be able to do it. And I'm going to talk about it in relation to the architectured, the designed, and the decorated interior, because they're all the same thing, OK? All of these things are enabled, I would argue, primarily through a series of site-specific strategies. And strategies are instruments. They are instruments which we use in order to reconfigure what is already there. And strategy, for me, is a really, really important word. I was having a conversation about this the other day in uh, Calgary, where I went to give a talk. I probably followed Paul on the flight back, where I talked about how... Um, how I try to talk with my students about never using the word concept. I find the concept quite a difficult word, and I, I always kind of get in trouble for this, and I'm sure you'll ask me lots of questions about this after, but concept for me is an abstract idea, whereas strategy for me is born out of what we know and what is there, and that's why I think it's a very, very important word. Anyway, we'll come to that. So I would argue that the making of the interior is fundamentally connected to this idea of strategy and to adaptation. Because essentially, what sets the interior apart from many other built environment subjects is it's about working with what's already there. Now, because of this quality, and it's very distinct, I think, for interiors, 
we create unique we, we create unique atmospheres, which I know is the kind of bigger umbrella theme of this series of conferences. Um, interior space, any space, buildings, architecture, whatever you want to call it, which is originated and formed and created through adaptation and through reconfiguring the existing, creates very, very distinct atmosphere. And it's very unique. You don't get, you cannot recreate this kind of atmosphere when you're building from scratch or doing new build, I would argue. So the mediation of what is around us, what is with us already, forming it, responding to it, understanding it, creates very, very unique spaces and in turn creates very, very unique atmospheres. And I think that's really important. It's impossible to create distinct atmospheres in new build as you would with working with what is already there. How do I know this? Well, I'm an educator, as I say. I practice for a number of years. Don't do that so much. Write about it. And uh, I have a great fondness for working with students, and I really enjoy working with students. And uh, the current place I'm in is you know, a spectacular place for doing that. I get to work, uh, it's only a postgraduate uh, organization, so I get to work with some of the greatest students from around the world, I feel. Apart from Manitobians, of course. So wherever I've been, it's always the, the kind of processes and the approach that, uh, approaches that I use of working with students is about working with what, what we find. And that's great fun. So I've been a visiting professor in Milan for years, uh, where we did uh, lots of work, such as edible translations. We had a, because we were in Milan, I thought, well, well, you know, Milan food. So we started doing some work around waste food. In Antwerp, uh, I was a visiting professor there. I did a project with uh, students uh, with regards to a disused plinth in the courtyard of their school, where we made this fantastic project, which was actually really, really naughty and got me thrown off the job because uh, the students were making a protest to the dean of the school about the fact that he overlooked them. And whether it's a disused pier in the River Thames, you can see an image there by one of my students, J.G., or reworking a piece of IKEA furniture, doesn't matter. It's all about working with the found and working with stuff that's already in existence and repurposing it and making it into something new. And that's Currently, what I'm doing with my uh, students... Ah. ah. Sorry, you're going to get the music with this. I can't stop the music on this. It's really sombre. This is a project I'm working on at the moment with my students at the RCA. I run a platform called Interior Reuse. And uh, our projects are always working with existing buildings. We're working with uh, the National Trust in the UK, and we're working with uh, Allies of Morrison Architectural Practice in London. And we're looking at this building, Clandon Park. Clandon Park burnt down in 2015. As you can see, a rather tragic event, but it's left it in a rather beautiful condition. And uh, my students are currently working with this building and the National Trust. And we have a project called Radical Heritage. What do we do with buildings like this in the 21st century? I can't believe this music. It sounds really uh, a bit over the top. This is the manifesto for my platform, and my platform is concerned with the exploration and adaptation of matter that can be considered obsolete, and whether that material has been obsoleted through uh, loss in value, economics, or whether things like this, through fire. All situations have in common the proposition that an obsolete environment or element is a site of research, depredation, mediation, and then meaning and ensuring meaningful change takes place. So it's a beautiful project, and my students are really radically trying to reorganize what an approach to heritage might be with all kinds of ideas. This is just early stuff from the first... We've just been on this project for six weeks now, but some beautiful stuff emerging. The fire... Fire, I don't recommend anybody ever sets fire to a building, but it is an amazing way of exposing a building how it was made, what was hidden previously, and how you start to find out new things. And so my students are absolutely all over this building, licking it, smelling it, measuring it, photographing it, filming it, finding out the fact that once all the timber panelling has gone off the walls, it's exposing all kinds of weird contingencies, etc. Anyway, that's the kind of work that I do with my students. I hope you can read that, it's a bit small maybe, but... Why is working with the not new important? And why now? Well, 
I would argue, and hopefully you can read those, those are just two little quotes that I pulled out um, in the last couple of weeks, really. There's a real sea change, I think, and I don't think this is anything new, but I think it's just certain people starting to latch on to an idea. Building reuse is really gathering speed as an idea about sustainability, yes, but more so, it's an approach to cultural production in the 21st century, which is increasingly important. No more new build, I'm afraid, everybody. And this always frightens people from architecture. I've been a number of places recently where pretty much by 2050, people are talking about 2150, that there will be no more new build in the 21st century. Everything that we are going to make as built environment is already done, is already out there. So what do you do? How do you start to use this stuff? How do you start to take things apart? How do you learn from them? How do you make new stuff? These are just two quotes by uh, Edwin Heathcote in the Financial Times where he was moaning about Archigram and how out of date they were and embarrassing and how everybody should be thinking about restructuring existing buildings. Architecture Daily, we're talking about sustainability and how we rework. I like, um, uh, Arup did some interesting research, which I have come across, which was about the fact that pretty much by 2150, they're, they're talking about um, new build will be uh, pretty much extinct because of the way we are and because of the planet, the situation. So this obsession of mine about adaptation and reuse, which I've had for a long time, um, is really, uh, on one hand, about material culture, I think. And what I mean by that is I'm uh, really fascinated by things, by spaces, by learning from what's around us, hands-on kind of approaches to uh, what people do. Miriam's talk last night was fascinating. I love the idea of filling holes to make them look like they were never holes. I love the idea of material culture. I love the idea of getting my hands dirty and finding out about stuff. And I think interiors is very much a hands-on approach to what is out there already. It's a kind of material culture approach to our world. I'm interested in archaeology. I love the, no the notion of digging stuff up, etc. And if all of this stuff is out there already, then we'd better get moving on that and remixing that and reinventing it and understanding it in order to make it something new. These are images uh, which I've been using in, in the current book I'm writing about the history or the story of the interior, which is a history book. Uh, there's a great uh, archaeological approach, which n not many people know about, called spolia, which I believe the Manitobian students were talking about yesterday, before I did my talk. Spolia is a brilliant approach in archaeology where it can be very uh, easily surmised by the fact that in times of recession in Roman uh, or, archae uh, or in ancient times, when those Romans didn't have the money and the energy to go raping and pillaging across Europe, um, they would remake their own environments through cutting up monuments and uh, rechanging buildings. And uh, the Arch of Constantine is a brilliant example of spolia, actually, because it's made up of monuments from different places, almost like a collage. Uh, my thinking on that is that actually spolia is a truly interiors approach to making the built environment, because that's all we ever do. We're remixing what we already have. Anyway, on that basis, the history of this subject can be quite different because chronologically, you can't start to talk about styles of interior from Gothic through to Romanesque through to modern because we're just reworking what's already out there. So chronology goes out of the window. So that makes for a very, different, a very difficult history book, I have to say, but I'm having a go at that. Anyway, on that basis, all the stuff's out there already and we're just remixing it. We're making it different. We're putting it in a new context. We are desperately trying to rethink about our heritage, uh, the world around us, how we make it fit for purpose for something new. Therefore, if everything already exists around us, and I understand that's contentious, and you know, hopefully we can have some questions on that after. If everything already exists, then the site of the existing contains all the answers, doesn't it? If we think in that way. They contain the answers to the adaptations that we want to make. How do we unlock this stuff? That's the question then, if it's already there. How do we release narrative? How do we release these stories or these uses or these lives of this stuff? How do we make that pertinent again? Because don't forget, a lot of this stuff was made for a very different time. As I say, this is a talk about strategy, working with the not new, and I'm going to talk about a series of processes of unlocking this material. How you can marshal, how you can organise, edit, redefine existing matter. 
What is strategy? Again, etymology, my favorite. Stratagem, a general strategy, an act of generalship, which is rather a nice uh, um, explanation that I came across. I love these two here that I have on, on the screen. A clever or careful plan, the art of military planning, movements and operations. Another nice one, a skill in devising expedients. Wow, what a lovely thought. The notion that a strategy is all about devising some form of expedient way of dealing of the stuff that surround us. That's again why I like the word strategy in opposition to concept, because for me it's about marshalling the matter that's before you. Like a general in war, you're kind of moving your troops, moving your material, moving your armory, whatever you want, in order to negate, to edit, to suppress, to enhance various things around you. And that's what strategy is about. And that's why it's really important for interior or reuse approaches. That's why strategy is critical. So strategy in the interior is an instrument, it's an expedient device, it's a contingent operation. We're dealing, we never quite know what we're going to find once we start uh, taking apart buildings and spaces, once we start working with them. You never quite know what's going to be there and sometimes you, know, you can really find something that you never expected will be there as we all know. So it's a contingent device, an expedient device strategy. It's a way of marshalling our troops uh, in other words, the matter that is around us. And in my view, the uniqueness of the interior, and here I'm going to sort of advocate for the interior again, is that I think that it's one of its fundamental principles is working with not what's there already. There's other things about interiors which are in equally as important, but for me, one of the fundamental attributes is, and what marks us as being different to other built environment subjects, and I know there will be architects in this room and they'll say, well, I do this, I do it all the time. Of course you do. I'm not saying this is only interior people that do this. I would argue that it's an interior education that gives you the skills to do this. It's a, when were you in a school of architecture when you did a reuse project? Mm, not very much. You do it in interiors endlessly and repeatedly. But anyway, I'm not uh, being a separatist on this subject. Or am I? Um, it's really, I think, an interior fundamental uh, aspect of what we do. And uh, for me, this leads to the interior sensibility, which I'll touch on a, a little bit later, or maybe we can talk about. So we need very specific strategies for working with the not new. These devices, these instruments, are all about how we marshal the facts. And as I say, I really prefer this idea to concept, which I always find a little bit abstract. You know, when I work with students and they say, I've got this great concept and it's all about uh, the moon moving through Pluto. And you think, oh God, what's that got to do with anything? Talk to me about a strategy, about how you're going to work with that stuff that's there already. So I've produced a number of publications which really deal with strategy. And again, I give you the hard sell. Um, because I've realized over time that strategy is, is the critical thing. And uh, a lot of the books I've done have touched on this idea of strategy, in particular these two, or three actually. First book I did with Sally in 2004 was called Rereadings. That's 15 years ago, my God, almost. Um, which was the first book we did together and was essentially a response to uh, the fact that as a teacher early in my career, when I would talk to my students and they would say, where are you getting all this stuff from? And I'd be like, I don't know. Uh, and one of them said, why don't you write a book about it? And I thought, wow, what a great idea. And um, I've, I went to a publisher of the RIBA in London and... Um, they said, yeah, it's a great idea. We've got somebody else who also positioned a similar idea, and that was Sally. So we started working together, and we produced a number of books together. Fifteen years later, because Reba, I hope nobody in the room here is from Reba, but they're not, they're not very good publishers. Uh, Fifteen years later, after three sellouts of this book, they said, uh, oh, would you do volume two? Right, yeah. So we looked at the book again for rereadings two, used the same structure, but we talked, we changed the whole content of it because we wanted to recognize that in this 15 years, this subject has become much more important, much more critical, and isn't just a, a European, maybe North American biased process, actually. It's now really, really important in uh, Asia, Middle East, Far East, 
other countries which maybe normally wouldn't have taken this approach. I spent a month in Japan a couple of years ago talking to people who are now absolutely obsessed with reworking their built environment, which is a very different approach from previous years in that part of the world. So I'm going to use some of the ideas in these uh, in rereadings and also the later book, Adaptations, just to explain what I mean by strategy. So when formulating interior strategies, I always come back to the idea that we are working with what's there. And therefore, all of these instruments, I call them instruments, these strategies, are expedient devices. They're ways of operating, of resetting existing matter. It's where all of these books have started for me, this idea of process, this idea of taking us through a kind of series of ideas about how you work with what's there. Let's talk a little bit about rereadings first. As I said, in both volumes, I, you, we use the same structure. It's material-based, so essentially you cannot work with the not new, with the stuff that's already there, without the idea of analysing it. You have to ask it questions. What did this building do before? How are those bullet holes arrived in the forks, etc.? What's the history of the building, its previous use? How has the form and structure of the building started to influence what it looks like, how it stands up? What's the context and environment of the place? What's outside of it as well as inside? Because, you know, quite often interior people tend to forget that there is something going on outside that place. What about the new function? That's obviously critical program. What's going to go into it? Does it fit? Can you take things out of that? And, of course, sustainability, the idea that really... Um, and yet this is, this, we put sustainability into the second volume because uh, 15 years later we'd, we'd realised it become an increasingly important part of this type of work. So the idea of sustainability, how sustainable is this idea of building reuse? The second part of rereadings, one and two, was then formulating a strategy. Once you've made this analysis, once you've kind of understood the matter that you are dealing with and you're working with, and that can be physical stuff, don't forget it can also be intangible stuff, memories, history, feelings, smells, atmospheres, etc. Once you've kind of really built up a package of sense of all of this work, then you make your move, then you bring in your troops. You strategize. And we suggest, and I'm going to come back to these, that there were three main strategies at that time. Intervention, insertion, and installation. And I'm going to explain those in more detail in a short while. These were the most innovative parts of the book, I feel. And then tactics. Tactics for the interior designer, interior architect, interior decorator are plain, wall, floor, ceiling. And that could be both existing and new things that you apply. Objects, light, natural, artificial, surface. Surface is really fascinating because, of course, you know, all the idea of ornament and decoration is an anathema to so many people, but I think it's a wonderful part of being the, in the interior. And that can be a found surface, uh, something that we're dealing with that's, a, that's already here, or it can be something that we apply to the space to make identity. Openings is another tactic, windows, doors, thresholds, existing and new. And then, of course, movement, movement. Everything from stairs to ramps to bridges to elevators, etc. These are, these are the critical tactics, the things which with you realise your analysis and your strategies. As I said, um, strategies were the most innovative part of the book, I feel, and I still feel that today. That's where we were really doing something new. I've seen stuff about analysis before and you know, designing walls and things like that. It wasn't particularly innovative. But the idea that there were kind of three strategies uh, in those days were pretty useful, I thought, and actually started to really get us to understand how we work with the not new, the existing matter. Each of the strategies were really based on your relationship to adapting the existing, how you dealt with it. For instance, the first one was intervention. An intervention approach um, is really a very robust approach. It's where you decide that after your analysis um, and after really thinking about the stuff that you've got, you really want to reorder it. It might need demolition. It might need cutting up. You might need to take something completely apart. You might need to really, really kick it about in order to make something new. It's um, a strategy which is really about 
um, not being very, uh, how to put it, not being very um, sort of precious about the existing environment. You want to clarify, you want to destroy in some instances because you know, things might have been added that you think are poor or rubbish or you might want, this building might be so in such poor condition, it really needs to be clarified. The ultimate thing about an intervention strategy is that the new and the old end up being completely intertwined. And I always do this with my hands, but it makes sense. They, they rely on each other. You cannot remove the other from each other. So this image here is uh, Witherford, Witherford Watson Mann's Astley Hall, where the building was a ruin. They made a new building inside of it. The new and the old are completely co-joined. They cannot be removed without you know, the destro destroying of the building, essentially. I mean, this type of work is really personified by this guy, Matter Clark. I'm sure you all know this guy's work. He approached buildings with a chainsaw, essentially, and cut them open in order to clarify, undo them, to tell us stories about the building which maybe we'd never realised before, and to clarify connections between them in a way which was very, very important. The second strategy is insertion, slightly different to intervention. Insertion was about putting something inside, on top of, around, sometimes underneath, on the side of an existing building. It's autonomous to a certain degree, but it will take its um, proportioning from the existing. So in other words, it's built to fit. And that's quite important. So an insertion strategy, and I'll do the jazz hands again, is more like two things being placed together, but they are connected because they are related in size. Hope that makes sense. The third approach, and I'm, I think you can maybe see a pattern forming here, the third strategy of working with the not new is installation. It's a temporary approach, personified by temporal installations such as uh, a gallery, exhibition retail spaces, especially pop-up stuff, can be really installation-based. And the installation is very much about the building, the existing building and the new stuff, coming into contact with each other, but once removed, they leave the building relatively unscathed and untouched. There might be a few holes in the wall where somebody hung a painting or a pair of jeans. So in installation, the new stuff and the old stuff are pretty much unrelated, but the thing about installation is drama, needs to be enacted. There needs to be a kind of theatrical, powerful um, relationship between what's going into the building and what the existing building is. And therefore, installations quite often have lasting impact on the people who visited them or viewed them. So those are the three things, the three strategies that we unpacked in uh, rereadings, both one and two. And they, they kind of gathered pace for a long time. And I think they kind of become good uh, ideas, if I'm, you know, without sounding big, too big headed, but I think they've become strong ideas for the interior and interior specific ideas, building reuse ideas. Later on, I wanted to build on those because I thought, actually, there's probably more than three, uh, really, and there probably is a hundred more. I just haven't had time to think much more about them, but I'm sure there are many, many more strategies. And in adaptations, I decided that I would explore further strategies about working with the not new, and, and I decided that there was a whole series of them. So in essence, adaptations was building on rereadings and really thinking about what other what other ways are there of thinking about working with existing matter? What does it do to spaces? How do we kind of really make these specific, unique places, which again, I state, it's just not possible with new build. So beyond the three that Sally and I introduced, there were more, reprogramming, super use, artifice, narrative uh, on and off site. These were strategies that I felt in the subsequent time after rereadings that we could start to talk a little bit more about as in approaches to existing buildings, these instruments which gave us a way in to working with existing matter. Reprogramming. Reprogramming as a strategy is about how we make new use inside that building and how, what the tension is between that new stuff and the container or the envelope in which we're putting it, because there is a tension quite often. And this is a strategy that is used to recolonize uh, re spaces, uh, especially ones that have had a difficult past. Buildings um, have great histories and great memories. 
And sometimes buildings can have really terrible things that have gone on inside of them, and uh, they're very difficult to reuse sometimes. Sometimes people don't know what to do with buildings like that. Um, but I would argue everything's up for grabs, and you have to work out ways of dealing with this stuff. Demolition's an end game. It's kind of a waste of time for everybody and material. Anyway, reprogramming. Well, I'm a great fan of this guy, Nick Nicholas Buriard, great writer. Sorry about the big quote. I hope you can read that at the back. It's a big quote, but I'm going um, to kind of surmise it a little bit, really. But um, Buriard talked uh, in a book called Post-Production, which is a great favourite of mine. I don't know if you know what post-production is, but when you're filmmaking, uh, when you've done all the filming, you go into post-production, you make special effects, you add voices, etc. It's a way of remixing what you already have. It's a way of editing and putting stuff together. In uh, post-production, Buriard talks about how post-production is the 21st century way of making any cultural artifact, whether it be a piece of art, a sculpture, a piece of architecture, or a building. And quite specifically, he states that actually there is no more new stuff. I kind of agree with him. There's no more originality. Forget it. It's boring. Copyright. What a joke. Come on. The idea is, is that everything's out there already and you've just got to insert yourself into that flow of information and work out how you manipulate it into something new. I talk to my students about this often, about copying, about plagiarism and stuff like that. And they're often you know, absolutely frightened about me using these words because somehow plagiarism has been kind of riven into them that it's the work of the devil. Well, it kind of is. <laughs> From an institutional point of view, it is. But from a Graham point of view, I think it's really quite interesting. And actually, the notion of the copy is something that's sort of fallen foul of cultural production. Anyway, people like Buriard are really bringing back this idea that we can, or it has been for years, thinking about how we, how we just rework what's already out there. And that's what post-production's about. It's what reprogramming is about. So the idea of reinventing, reprogramming, reusing what's there already, a, a bridge, uh, a railway bridge becomes a public park in London. A big power station becomes an art gallery, etc. That's what reprogramming is, is about. That's what we do as interior people. So whether it's a sawmill in Madrid, whether it's a coal mine in Belgium, who knows? It's all there to be reprogrammed. Superuse. This is a phrase coined by a group called 2012 Architecton, uh, Netherlands designers, really interesting group of people. Those guys, along with, there's a group in Belgium called Rotor, R-O-T-O-R, who I work with at the RCA, who are fantastic guys. They're doing a fantastic project with the students in architecture at the moment. These poor students, they were quite bemused. Rotor asked them to document the whole of the building in which we exist uh, as a resource and then think about how you redeploy the building. So taking it apart in order to use all of those parts. And they've done this kind of incredible inventory of everything from light switches through to ducting, through to the building, uh, other building material, lifts, et cetera, et cetera. Their whole work is about how they're going to redeploy this building somewhere else and the parts within it. Superuse is an approach which essentially involves the recycling of the existing. And superuse is a very specific strategy, which is where um, the superuse guys, when they're working on a project, they literally put a pin in the map where the project is. They draw a line around the site to about a kilometre. Let's see if I've got an image of it. Ah, sorry, I'm a bit ahead of myself. They put a line in the map, there we go, where they draw uh, a kilometre kind of route around the building. And then everything, it's called a harvest map, and everything from that kilometre um, radius uh, is up for grabs for reuse in the building. It's a super use approach. Now, that obviously relies on contingency, it relies on waste, salvage. Um, that's a, it's a very difficult process because I, I know that sometimes you know, they can earmark 20 doors on a building site and then they've been skipped the next day, etc. So it's a very contingent strategy based on what you find and how you can secure it. Um, but these guys, and also Rota, are really uh, quite incredible, I think, with regards to how they're making strategy about the existing in order then to start to use it. The harvest map is a really beautiful idea. This is a, a project they did in Rotterdam, which is the Hacker office, essentially recycled from uh, a, a kilometer radius of the site in Rotterdam, um, which is in Rotterdam port, 
where they essentially were skip hunting, salvaging, building sites, picking stuff off uh, other sites. And this ranged from all kinds of things you can see on this image here, from bits of greenhouse uh, through to tons of uh, waste fabric that somebody had thrown out, which they formed into a wall, uh, which became a movable wall for separating out a conference space, tea crates, all kinds of stuff. Essentially, it's a strategy which is really agile because, you know, as a designer of this stuff or a manipulator of this stuff, you've got to be really thinking on your feet about how you work with this stuff, how you might be able to put it together, how you're going to persuade a bunch of builders to put that together, which, you know, that alone is a pretty tough order. So super use. It's a really contingent approach to what is out there already and how you manipulate what is there to make it into something new. The notion of artifice as a strategy, I think, is incredibly important for us as designers. And when you, again, look at the English dictionary, the word artifice is described as the art of constructing or the craft of the technician. And it's also described, rather nicely, I think, as an ingenious maneuver, a trick, or a device. So the idea that we can think of making stuff remaking stuff that somehow is deceitful, I think is actually really quite potent in the interior and something that we're quite good at. It's kind of scenography, I suppose, in a way. And I think it's a very interior-based idea. We quite often make scenographic uh, backdrops, I think, for people in which they live their lives or they work or they play, etc. So employing the art of cunning as a strategy I think is really good and interesting for interiors. So again, a project in uh, something like Artifice, this is the Coop Pavilion in uh, Holland, which is uh, uh, in a portrait gallery in Holland, which is uh, essentially was a, a new pavilion was placed in the center of this room, um, which as you can see, kind of disappears, it dematerializes, it's made out of reflective surfaces. And actually when you go inside the pavilion, you're asked to place your own portrait inside this space. But essentially, this is an example of a strategy of artifice, the idea that you make stuff which disappears in a room. It's a kind of trick or a maneuver. That's the inside of the pavilion there with people leaving their own selfies in this portrait room. The last couple, uh, narrative, storytelling as a strategy for working with existing matter. Existing matter, ha everything has a story to tell and sometimes that might be quite banal and uh, that gives you a certain challenge. Other times there are really incredible stories that need to be told and as a designer, how do you, uh, how do you operate in that context? How do you somehow realize these stories? Every, state, every space has a storytelling potential, I think, and sometimes those narratives are things you want to enhance, and other times they might be things that you want to suppress and edit out because they're not very nice or people want to forget them, etc. It's up to you. As a designer, you've got to think about that existing matter. What do you do with it? Sometimes buildings uh, have really, really distinct stories, and sometimes you cannot but avoid telling them. This is a project which really is about uh, narrative, um, which is about really about telling the experience. It's in Milan, and it's a, it's a really very desperate story, really. It's a project that still isn't fully open. It's not fully realized. I've had the privilege of um, being shown around by Guido Morporgo, who designed the project, who, uh, if you ever want to see this place, I'll connect you because you have to see it. It's, very, uh, it's not very well known, but um, uh, underneath Milan Central Station, that fantastic grand central station, there's a little side platform. And uh, unfortunately, in the Second World War, Italian Jews were deported through this little side entrance, which was a, a post office uh, entrance where the post would go onto tracks, straight up into trains, straight up to the tracks, and then shipped out. Unfortunately, there's a really dark side to Italian history, which is very rarely told, which was about the, the deportation of the Jews uh, in Italy. This uh, station place was, uh, this little side place was used for that horrible journey. And Morpurgo and his partner, for years, years and years and years, raised money to try to somehow relay the story. And obviously, you can imagine, it's a very, very controversial story. So he spent a long time and a lot of energy 
creating this place. Uh, it's a real example in the undercroft of the building, as you can see from this image, of telling the story, the narrative of that space, and how it becomes something for us to learn from a story. You're met as you walked in by this thing, the wall of indifference, which is this huge concrete wall with indifference imprinted into it. It's an incredible uh, moment as you enter into the interior. And don't forget, it's a working station, so above us, the trains are rumbling past us all of the time as a kind of sound chamber reminder of what went on before, and still goes on today in many ways. The building's not finished, as I say. They're still trying to get funds together. Uh, eventually, there will be a library, which you can see on your right-hand side, left-hand side, images of what the library will be like in this space as well. But it's still not finished. It's currently closed. You can't gain access unless you contact uh, Mopurgo Curtis. So that's a story of narrative as a strategy, telling stories about existing matter in a way where you know, sometimes we have to deal with really quite tough storytelling. The final strategy I just wanted to talk about was about on and off site. The construction and fabrication of elements away from site, uh, which then are transported to site, is I think a really enduring strategy for working with the not new and enduring matter. Off the peg, specification and bespoke fabrication really can lead to very unique uh, situations with regards to how you deal with what is already there. Conservation, preservation, restoration also deal with the idea of placement and also you know, working off, off and on site as well. Off site can lead to, on off site can lead to um, all sorts of things, batch, batch production, one off production, bespoke, modularization. This is an image of a Madrid abattoir where the designer uh, came across roof, a big pile of roof tiles, which he then used to fabricate the wall on the inside of this building. So the notion of a modularized unit, a roof tile, suddenly becomes a, a very handy and contingent approach to making your wall as it gets stacked up on the inside of your building. And on-off site can lead to all kinds of innovative solutions. This wonderful image on the bottom there is a uh, is a project in uh, China where these guys, um, architecture research officers, I think it was, an, uh, an architecture for the people, I can't remember the exact name of the, the group, um, they used the Chinese Amazon, Taobao, I don't know if you know this, but um, to order a bunch of aircon uh, units which then became their interior. So that's a really good example of you know, the idea of a strategy about utilizing a real off-site production system. A nice example in the UK is this little one-off little artist residence in Snape by Howarth Tompkins, which, as you can see, is a prefabricated core 10 structure dropped into this old dovecot, which became a little uh, residence for the artists and musicians. And you can see how kind of perfectly built to fit as it dropped into that little ruined little building. So, to conclude, working with the not new, it's a strategy is key for working with what's there already, I would argue. You need these kind of bunch of instruments. And it's not a didactic approach. You might use one, two, three, or more of them, etc. Whatever you use, it's got to be a, a way of thinking about adapting what is there already. And don't forget, so many of these things that we work with, whoever put them together in the first place will have never, ever considered that 10 years, 20 years, one week, whatever it is, down the line that somebody's going to turn their work into a, a marketplace or a bank or a pub, whatever. So don't forget, when you are using these strategies for, the, uh, existing, for existing matter, somebody's going to do it to you in another five minutes, ten years, whatever. So you're just one story in the way that this stuff will carry on, especially as is suggested that after 2050, there ain't going to be no more new build. So the embedded knowledge in this stuff, we have to unlock it, and we have to have the capacity to unlock it, and we have to be a designer, an architect, whatever you want to call yourself, who can edit and suppress and enhance this work in a way which can repurpose it for a new use and uh, you know, a new future, hopefully, rather than a straightforward demolition. Um, Fred Scott, 
a great friend of mine who talks eloquently, far more than I, about existing buildings, likes to talk about the way that the new stuff becomes a shadow of what was there already. And I think that's rather a beautiful way of talking about it, that somehow we're stripping out, we're kind of readying, we're draining ponds, we're kind of thinking about what's going to go into this place, we're uncovering stuff we never realised was in there and we're getting slightly scared because the budget shoots up, because all of this stuff's been found. Whatever goes in there, Fred talks about it as being a shadow, which I quite enjoy the idea that somehow we're creating these shadows of work. I would also suggest that this approach leads to unique atmospheres, which is the umbrella kind of idea of all of these conferences, because as I keep saying, it's just impossible to recreate this type of atmosphere in new build, I would argue. It's a condition that is enhanced through working with what's there already. So to finish on uh, a toilet, of course, Duchamp's urinal. Duchamp, my favorite ever artist ever, the greatest interior design that nobody ever calls an interior designer. The idea that we approach existing matter creates what I would call a unique sensibility because not everybody is comfortable, happy, or even excited like I am and others about working with what's there already and obs or obsessed by it actually. But then there are some people and I think that, that some people have this kind of incredible sensibility about really being fascinated about what is there. And it's a sensibility, I argue, that really is pertinent to interiors as well as other built environment disciplines. But as Duchamp says, everything or anything can be beautiful. And that's working with the not new. Thank you. Some questions, I'm sure. to think about, a lot to challenge, a lot to confront. <laughs> and so these aren't uh, questions so much as comments. First of all, I would challenge this notion that we're not going to be building after 2150. <laughs> it has a lot to do with where you are in the world and what materials you're using. If you have masonry buildings, like here, it's one thing. If you're building out of wood frame in California, it's, it's something much else. Yeah. Um, I also actually challenge Bouriard's writings. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff he, he purports the artist, he supports a lot of crap, and I'll put his, his relational aesthetics into that as well, because there are no standards for evaluation. I mean, Duchamp may have said that everything can be beautiful, but the question is, who's thinking it's beautiful and under what time and, and whatever. Yeah. Um, some of your things are just semantic. I think, you know, what some of people call concepts is probably the tactics side of yours. Yeah. Although I think in its worst moment, you're right, it replaces the strategy. I think really the path most of the time is analysis, strategy, concept, form, tactics, whatever you want to call it. And I think actually inserting that notion of strategy is a good one because it means you have to think rather than just these kind of stuff students come up with, you know, I'm going to make it like a crab, you know, these kind of things. Um, there's a question also with these strategies that, that you propose. I just wonder, because there's the big one I found with interiors, and it's especially true of museum exhibit designers, is whether they respect or do anything in terms of the architectural structure, whether it's new or old, or they just completely subsume it. The first image you showed was a dark space with no windows and kind of a floating cloud in it. And a lot of interiors are done that way with absolutely no respect for the existing structure, yeah. which I think is a valid strategy. I wouldn't say that, but there's probably a gradient from working with truly historical structures like the ones that uh, Miriam showed last night, as opposed to stuff that just uses fodder for for new uses. Yeah, sure. Uh, also, I think it's important to remember that the architecture adapts 
as well as the interior. It's, it's not only inside. Yeah. The big questions, I think, with proposing adaptation as an end all, and, and I know Rotor and Lionel and whatever, is that economics really come into this argument. You know, it's most of the time it's more expensive to adapt and remake than it is, at least in the US. You just flatten the sucker and, and start over. Um, also, materials advance. So the notion of just keeping traditional materials, there are times for insulation values or various other purposes, that actually new stuff makes more sense. And lastly, as if I haven't said enough already, um, <laughs> where are the people? I didn't see one person in any of those photographs. And I would argue that your concepts, your strategy and stuff should have a little bit more about the social dimension rather than just the architectonic. Yeah, sure. yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a nice point. I didn't realize that there were no people in there, but that's my oversight. But yeah, people are critical to the interior, of course. Thank you. I appreciate very much uh, the way that you are uh, adapting terminology, adapting words in the presentation and helping us understand the vocabulary of design as well as the vocabulary of the buildings. And I have one comment about the notion of concept and then a, a <laughs> question. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I completely take your point that concept has been degraded in, in, in some contemporary thinking as, as an abstraction. But if you go back to the original Italian, in this case, uh, in Michelangelo's use of the word concepto, this is a, an amorous uh, insemination of the desire of the people and the artist into material, mm. right? The impregnation of the stone with the desire of the artist. Wow. And one could think about Michelangelo as an exceptional interior designer in the Medici Chapel, mm. right? Which transforms uh, the masonry into these voluptuous bodies which are as alive as they are yeah. dead. Um, so that's one comment on the notion yeah. of concept. But then I have a question, I guess with the, maybe touching on, on things that Mark raised, there is an, with the adaptive reuse, along with that often comes issues of gentrification. And, and it is the case that the beautiful examples that you, you have shown in the very helpful strategies with which we can think about them, they're often converting industrial works into uh, facilities for leisure um, and I'm wondering what is your take on the issues of gentrification and if and if we are not building 50 years from now would it be that these new skyscrapers of condominiums will be re-inhabited as social housing it's an interesting point um, just to come back to concept first and foremost and then we'll do gentrification concept yeah, I, I kind of always regret saying that because somebody always puts around and says, I'm bloody concept, blah, blah, blah. So I backtrack on that a little bit. I think it's years of teaching of students being fairly abstract. So I get that. Gentrification. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Uh, I think that it, there's a whole mindset that needs to change with regards to how we make our cities and how we put our cities together. And, and I might be saying this from a very UK-centric kind of observation really but where we're coming from in the UK um, the the way that we're performing the way that our cities are being made and this is you know 50 days away from one of the biggest ruptures that's ever going to happen in our country and uh, the way that we're putting our cities together and the way that we're thinking about our cities has to radically change I work in London a city that has been hollowed out from the inside uh, by the rich people park their money in London probably much like New York into property so the whole thing about gentrification and who uh, owns the city, who lives in the city, where the city begins and ends, I think is really interesting and important. And I think that, you know, in my view, where I work, I work in um, West London, which is very, very posh, very, very rich. Uh, whenever I travel to and from work, 
if it's dark in the evening, there's no lights. It's, it's a well-known phenomena of lights out London because nobody lives there. So to re-inhabit, re-gentrify those places, I think is, an, is a moral imperative, actually, to take back uh, those spaces. Now, that's easy for me to say. That's going to require legislation. It's probably going to require the huge recession that we, were, we will undergo now because of Brexit. And I think that might significantly change the way that we think about gentrification and cities. But um, I think reuse plays a massive part of that, really. You know, I go past thousands and millions of pounds worth of high-end real estate buildings in Kensington every day, and I'm already thinking about how I might squat them when Brexit comes. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes, hey. Um, Where's that? Oh, there. Yeah. So, uh, no, thank you for the presentation. It was really insightful, I think, on a lot of different strategies that kind of get thrown around but not necessarily talked about in depth in architecture school, like you had mentioned to a certain point. And uh, I guess my question to you would be, um, with these kind of very specific interventions that you talk about in the adaptations, um, what do you foresee as kind of their life? Or you know how in the same way that you work with buildings that were not necessarily intentioned to be reused into something else, these new additions that you're creating that are becoming, in a way, a part of the building, what is their foreseeable, like what is their adaptation? And, yeah, you know, that's a really interesting one. I think, I think uh, the, the sooner people get into the mindset that what they're building and creating in, is in itself a thing that will be adapted and reworked again, that your kind of um, approach to uh, whatever you're doing has, an, has a certain timeline that isn't infinite, that won't become a classic that won't be around for a long time, etc. I think the sooner people um, start to understand that, and many people do already understand that, the better, because then we can start to think about things where they will be made in a way where they can be taken apart again, reused, redeployed, fixed, repaired, maintained, whatever it takes. So, uh, and I think there are some really good examples of that already, and people are already thinking in that way. And I just think that that needs to become a really significant part of design school process, thinking about how we design, especially in education. I'm an educator. I quite often work with students in a way where we talk about projects which we have to talk about them, how they're going to last for five minutes or five years. And how do we design them in a way where somebody could come along with a spanner and take them apart and put them somewhere else, etc. So I think these are good ways of thinking about design. And I think you know we need to see more of that in the built environment. It's happening already, but I think it's critical. I think it's a good part of interiors, actually, what we do. I think we're kind of, many people, not just interiors, but I think we are kind of, there's a bit inside of our brains already which is about the temporary and which is about the excitement of things only appearing for a short period of time and then disappearing. So I think that's important. I think it's, you've got to, you've got to think in that way. Thank you. Okay. But I just want to say, I'm a few on concept. Yeah, really concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about your concept. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot.